Hi, I'm Charlie Bosco, and you're watching Plastic Weekly. All right, I'm here with a five-time World Cup gold medalist and two-time combined world champion and now Olympian Sean McCall here at Joe Rockheads. Uh, first of all, thanks for dropping by Toronto and letting people talk to you and get to see you now that you've made this accomplishment. So I really appreciate you visiting, man. Yeah, no problem. I'm always, uh, always happy to come by Joe Rockheads. Uh, so you're on the Canadian Olympic team now. I know you've been thinking about this for a while. Now that it's real, what changes about like your day-to-day -day life and, and your travel? Like, what's new now that you've been designated as this like Olympian? I mean, not a lot. Okay. Uh, the biggest thing now is that the biggest thing is just the Olympics. I qualified early, the earliest possible. So in August, I basically had a year where I actually finished out the season. Now just took an off season, and I can now just think about the Olympics. Whereas 2019 was the longer season because I had to be prepared for the whole boulder season, then the whole lead season, then the actual world championships to make sure I was in shape. And then I also had to hedge my bets because there was only eight spots available at the world championships. So if I wasn't in the top eight, then I would have to go to Toulouse. So it was a lot more hedging my bets and 2000 or 12, 2020 will be the Olympics. And so it makes my focus a lot uh, easier to manage. Yeah, You've got a lot of time until then, so how do you spend your time just training? Like, are you treating it basically as one long shot to the Olympics? Or are you going to take another break some point uh, before August? I mean, I doubt I'll actually take a really big break, uh, barring any injuries, of course, where you have to take breaks. But I'm focused on the Olympics. You know, it's August 4th, so I'm preparing everything to be ready August 4th. And, you know, it'll probably be really similar. Bouldering at the beginning of the season, speed climbing, and then lead climbing, usually, you know, normal April, May, June. So... Nothing will really change from that standpoint. The only thing that will really change is the number of competitions I do between now and the Olympic Games. So let's go back a little bit to August of 2016. So the Olympics are just finally announced after a bit of like a, a, a false start earlier on. Uh, and you were a big part of that process. Mm -hmm. So in that meeting, uh, the IOC announces you're formally an Olympic sport. And I'm sure you were excited. What was, what was most exciting about that moment? Was it the fact that suddenly now you can become an Olympian? Or was it more that, you know, we brought this sport to this new level. Like, what really was the was the prominent emotion you were feeling then? So yeah, you're right. It was 2016 August. Uh, I was actually at the trade show in Salt Lake City. Uh, I knew that they were going to do it, so I went on my phone. I went into a corner and I watched it live. It was unanimous. And uh, the first thing I actually thought of was more of a definitely more of a personal. I thought, wow, we're we're in the Olympics. I, I have a chance to be an Olympian. I knew it was going to be, you know, a two, three, four year process. And then when I thought about it more, I thought, of course, this is a huge accomplishment for climbing. I was still president of the Athletes Commission, so yes, I had a lot to do with it. But a huge step forward for everyone. And just the thought of now being in a sport that wasn't in the Olympics for, you know, 18 years, and now it's in, a, in the Olympics, and it happens to be in a discipline that I'm strong at, was was crazy to think of and then I wanted it more than anything to, to be an Olympian and to be an Olympian climbing would be really a dream come true. Back in 2016 uh, you had a really good year um, and in 2012 was kind of your peak year I think like eight medals or something like that like a lot of success around that time and then in the couple years that followed in 2017 you had a finger injury uh, which kind of put you out for a lot of the rest of that season and for the years following 2017, 2018, 2019 it was fewer medals than before not getting those uh, combined world championship places anymore. Although in fairness, they like changed how you calculate that or create that. Um, but now that the Olympics is in and you have a couple of years that maybe don't go as well as they did in the past. Um, and that culminates in the 2019 season, which just ended where for the first time since like 2007, you didn't walk away with an event win, but you qualified for the Olympics. You won or you uh, got bronze medal in the lead discipline. How does all of that like come together to make you feel knowing, okay, I'm an Olympian now, but there was this period where I wasn't at my best compared to before. How do you process all that going into maybe like the biggest competition you've ever climbed in? I think I take it as a realist. Um, I'm 32 years old. I'm not getting any younger. And if we're going to say that my best years were when I was 24, 25, 26, so be it. I mean, it's not going to change what it is now, how old I am now moving into the Olympics. I did win my last World Championships uh, actually about a month after it was announced in September of 2016. And then 17 and 18 were really hard years because of injuries. Uh, yeah, I tore a tendon, uh, yeah, I tore a pulley, sorry, in, in one of my fingers. And then at the end of, of that year, just as I started to come back onto that finger, I actually uh, tore a hamstring. 
And so that compounded to 2018. And then in 2018, I had a pinched nerve in my spine. And so all these things just, you know, I would fix one thing and then I would try to jump back into it, hurt yeah. something else. And uh, people say like, oh yeah, as soon as you get 2930, your body starts to <laughs> shut down. And so yeah. maybe I needed to take that a little bit more to heart. And so one of the biggest focus of 2019 was not only qualify for the Olympics, but it was try to remain injury free. Um, so I really take that to heart. Uh, I tell the younger generations now that there's more of them, uh, you know, all my wisdom of all the years on the World Cup circuit. But as as ironic as it is, is that uh, I am getting older, but I do feel more motivated. And I did make the Olympics in at 32. So pushing forward again, 2020 is going to be a year where, yeah, you know, uh, try to avoid injury as much as possible. And if it happens, you just deal with it. Um, Speaking of those other climbers, you know, generations younger than you, in some cases, what, like 15, 16 years younger than you, your first World Cup, you would have been like 16, I guess, like 2003 uh, in Italy. Yeah, possibly. Um, so you've gone through all of this. So Alberto Hines Lopez was the breakout male climber uh, for this year. Do you feel, so with the context of you guys are always traveling, you're never necessarily in the same spots aside from World Cups, do you feel like you are taking on a bit of a mentorship role or is there a barrier just because of the nature of the international circuit? I feel like I've definitely taken a mentorship role and uh, even on the Canadian circuit, I, I think of myself as a mentor to the younger generations. Uh, I could have theoretically stopped competing in 2015 2016 but I I still loved it and that's the number one thing I always ask myself at the beginning of the season and kind of the whole way through the season is do I like competing anymore and the answer is yes I still love competing I go I love going through the process I love going to the comps uh, obviously I love winning um, and then yeah seeing the next generation of climbers and it's funny because usually I just look at the birth years on the start lists right. so now we have birth years of 2003 yeah. And uh, just like Che Yun Sung, who, you know, won four Lee World Cups this year. And, you know, a, a lot of them may have grown up or been 12, 13 watching me being in World Cups. And now I'm still here, just, you know, kind of chugging along. But um, I'm really proud just to be in this role. Yeah, uh, so another Canadian, Elena Yip, who uh, you were talking about, you don't know when it is you're going to qualify if you manage to qualify. Mm -hmm. World Championships didn't work out for her. Toulouse, unfortunately, didn't work out for her as well. And so she's in a scenario where she's going into the North or the Pan American Championships uh, as a last chance uh, qualifier. Um, in, in my opinion, I feel like she's kind of a favorite, uh, especially in the women's field. Um, you know Elena pretty well. In this scenario where it's something she wants desperately, it might be the biggest achievement of her career. Um, how do you think somebody would cope, somebody, Elena specifically, how do you cope with that amount of pressure when you know it's the ultimate prize, you may be the favorite, and it's your only shot? It's like, that seems like a very high pressure scenario. How do you deal with that situation? I mean, I agree with, uh, yeah, basically everything you said. Uh, she is one of the favored to win. And it is a stressful situation, and I'm sure she will be stressed. Uh, one thing to, that I always remind all the climbers is that it's very normal to be stressed. If she wasn't stressed about the competition, I would actually be worried. Um, because maybe she would just be like, oh, you know, I'm just hot shot, I'm just going to go and win. And yeah, she will be probably stressed. And at the same time, she should know that she has the capability to win. You know, if she has a good climbing day, she's going to win bouldering and she's going to win lead. And if she breaks her PB in speed, and everyone does, you know, average on paper, then hopefully she would be in the top three. And, you know, a 3 one, one is, like, better than yeah, any competitor. I think Yanya got a 7-1-1 at the World Championship for a score of seven. And so, yeah, it'll come down to how she does in the comp day. Uh, she knows that. She's been training well. She made the first two qualifiers and unfortunately wasn't good enough. Um, but, but she's climbing well. She has this last shot. And the system was built so that you do have three shots. And so um, I know that it would mean a lot to her. It would mean a lot to me uh, going along with a, a really, really good friend of the Olympics. And so I really hope she makes it. Speaking of good friends, uh, in the past you've mentioned a couple uh, mentors of yours, uh, and I'll go through each one individually, but one of them first was Mike Doyle, uh, somebody who never describes himself as particularly strong in interviews, so I'll, I'll leave it up to him to, to describe himself. But um, what, what kind of role did he play in your development? Where was he in your, uh, in your, in your road to this point? So now that I've had a, time, a, t a chance to think about it, so Mike was my basically my climbing coach, along with Andrew Wilson, who basically was my climbing coach to start with. Yeah, we'll get to him for sure. So Mike Doyle was the one that kind of like picked me up at 12, and 
I, I, can't, I owe it to him for who the climber I am today. Uh, not only for my strength, but I would say uh, he, I, I am, or he taught me everything I know about mental resilience. So it's actually more of that now that I've been able to analyze my climbing career and all that, is I actually find that my mental game of climbing is one of the strongest on the circuit, if not maybe the strongest. And I learned all that from Mike, the way that he can compartmentalize stuff. He went through a background of computer science, the way, he, you know, something happens, you deal with it, you control the controllables. So my whole mental game is something that it is really hard to teach. And now seeing, again, more generations going through the, the, the machine of training and everything, a lot of them, I would say, are just as strong as me. And they just can't compete when you say compete. And that's, that is part of the mental game. And so... More and more, I've been trying to analyze that so I can pass it down through the generations. But that was definitely something that he taught me and that uh, that will always be with me. And then the other one you mentioned already, uh, being Andrew Wilson, who now is also the high performance director for Canada and I think still the like interim head coach. I'm not sure where that is at right now. Uh, so so what's, what's that road been like? Because I imagine for him, he was a different person when he started with you and now he's taken on this very official high level role, as high as you can get in Canada. So how has that evolved? Yeah, so Andrew was, uh, you know, one of my very first climbing coaches at, say, 10 years old. And, you know, uh, Mike started coaching me around, I guess, 11 or 12. I don't really remember the dates. But Andrew was the person that brought us together and that had the program. He was co-owner of the Edge, Cl Edge Climbing Center back in the day. And so he was the person that brought all these systems together. And even if it was a lot of the time Mike that was, you know, he had the whip and he was cracking it at me. Andrew was the person that was bringing it all together, and uh, them as a team going going to the World Championships. Um, he's been a, along the journey for a long time. He even stepped away from climbing for a handful of years. Uh, you know, I guess he lost his passion a little bit for it, but it's super good to see him. You know, he came back again four or five, six years ago, and he refound the passion for climbing. And uh, you know, he also has two sons. He watched he's watched them grow up now, and they're heavily into sports. So it was really cool to see him back into it. He is the current high performance director, uh, current team coach, and uh, you know he's he's brought the program forward. And I'm really excited to see what he's going to do in the next few years, especially yeah now that we do have an Olympian. Hopefully, we'll have two, um, you know, moving forward. All right. So I want to draw a couple comparisons with some like uh, some stuff you've experienced in the past. So you spent a lot of time training in France. Uh, you've been back in Canada. Um, I'm a gym rat, so I'm really interested in how facilities serve different people. And you're a really unique type of customer in that you have uh, needs and, and goals that most climbers, well, they might have the same goals in their head, but practically it's not the same kind of thing, right? So what, what do you look for in a facility that makes it ideal for your situation of being an elite level climber with, with very high level goals? What makes a good facility for you? So it kind of comes down to three, call them the three pillars, like a triangle. <laughs> it's, the, it's the climbing gym, mm -hmm. it's the hold selection, and it's the route setting team. Okay. This is more talking about like bouldering, lead climbing, kind of that kind of things. So when I want to do that kind of stuff, I need good tone, turnover so that you know, I get climbing, climbing skills. The second part that's more of, we'll say, the training side of it is I look for what can I make up in this gym and then is there a place where I can basically do like campusing and campus board. Mm -hmm. Along with that, the rest of the stuff with climbing, like, uh, you know, any type of conditioning or any, I can go to any, any gym. Any gym's going to have weights, dumbbells, right. a squat rack, uh, some place where I can do box jumps. But the other thing is I need to go look for specific gyms in order to find those tools. Um, are, do you find now that you're in Canada, you're finding places that, that fit all of those uh, spots as much as they did in Europe? Because there's a different like climbing culture there. Mm -hmm. um, are you starting to see places keep up with what you got used to out in Europe? I would say they, they're trying. Uh, a lot of facilities generally lack one or two of, of what I'm talking about for competition climbing. Uh, whether it's they don't invest enough into new holds or whether their root setting staff is more oriented towards commercial setting versus competition setting. But if that's what their clientele wants, it's hard for me to be like, hey, you guys need more competition routes, where it's like, well, Sean, you're the only person to do it. And like, it looks great on Instagram, but uh, but a lot of the gyms, you know, slowly they take, you know, the, the V10 boulder that I'm doing and then make a V7 and a V4 along the same path so that someone that's climbing a V4 can, can be on the same walls as us and, and be able to feel the movement. It's just an easier grade. So I think that's actually a great opportunity for gyms to, in order to 
go towards the competition setting. The other comparison was you spent a bunch of time on American Ninja Warrior, which is like a big budget broadcast, presumably a lot of, you know, for your experience as being in that case, maybe like talent, but being an athlete through that, I'm sure you got to experience an entirely different world of how of how a big show is presented. Um, what did you come away from that with thinking like, man, I'd love to see this in like competitive climbing one day? I mean, aside from the prize money, that's like the one big thing, right? It's funny, even the prize money, I could never win the million dollars. Uh, our prize money was like maybe a thousand dollars to go down. It was really, it was really just like a show because we did all the filming in, I think, one night and then a little bit of B-roll over the next couple of nights. But it's unfortunate that I couldn't go win the million dollars, but a lot of people did think that I could have won it. I thought that too. I didn't know that. Uh, but, but the whole experience is, it, it is just fun. It it is like going on a vacation where you get to go to Las Vegas, hang out with all the other ninjas who most of them are super cool. And then you get to go on a reality TV show that they, they flew you in to do. And so all the aspects of the whole show is really, really fun. And then I did think about, okay, what kind of aspects would I want uh, to bring into climbing? And then the really hard part is that a lot of the stuff in Ninja Warrior moves. Right. And when we think of climbing, I'd be personally really annoyed if we started making moving obstacles okay. at the World Cup level, okay. let's say. Really fun at some local, maybe like some, some fun ones, because I've seen lots of moving obstacles that are really cool. And then a lot of the, the movement is like uh, the ninjas are really, really good at lache movement. So when they're on some sort of hole, they need to swing, and they need to actually do like a six or eight or ten foot gap and then hold on to another one. And so Drew Dretchel, who just actually won this current season, actually the million dollars all of Ninja yeah. Warrior. He is like the best lasher that I've ever seen. Like he, when he lashes, his body just goes completely horizontal and he catches the thing like, I don't know, 12 feet away. And then I, I do this weird like awkward like up and down like because I'm trying to catch, but, uh, but the, the athleticism of them are really high. That's cool. Um, you spent a lot of time also being uh, a figurehead and a representative for athletes uh, at the IFSC. Um, and with all of this Olympic qualification stuff, there's been a lot of new things going on and a lot of interesting situations that have come up. And um, following uh, the Toulouse qualifier, you were doing these great little live streams and I really appreciated kind of they would finish the speed round, you'd give some reflections, finish, uh, finish the boulder round, give some reflections. I thought that was awesome. Um, and one of the comments you made was after the men's league qualifier, four men topped. And you made a comment that, you know, for athletes, in your perspective, having one top in a round is ideal. That's perfect. It's an obvious winner. If there are two tops, you mentioned that was like near catastrophe level. And I know this was probably hyperbole, but if there were three tops or more, that somebody should maybe lose their job over that. And you and I both understand that like root setting is, is always hard and stuff. Um, and then on top of that, I imagine a lot of broadcasters in the IFSC like the idea of tops but how do you and the rest of the athletes um, take your perspective and how do you work together with those other parts because those are really important things to you guys as athletes but from those other perspectives that's a challenge um, so how does that all come together I mean coming from the business perspective the athletes commission is one body of the IFSC and it is up to the IFSC board to eventually make the final decisions if the IFSC board and the rest of the IFSC machine basically wants to see four tops even if the athletes are really against it um, it might not happen uh, that's just kind of we'll say the world of business right um, they do listen to us a lot which I'm really really happy about and so that that is a is not, I wouldn't say a constant struggle but it is it is a conversation and uh, as a climber we definitely want to see one top but if you talk to almost every other party that's not climbers, they want to see more more than three tops. And so it is funny, I talked to people and I, someone that's never climbed before, I said, uh, hey, so what did you think about those four tops? And it was amazing. I can't believe four climbers were that good to get to the top. And, and I can see their passion in it. And yeah, from one side, it, it's kind of like, oh, like, oh, I really wish he would have just said that he didn't like it so that I'd have more ammunition. And so I get it. And so it is, it is uh, again, it's a conversation. It's, uh, it's hard, but the athletes are on board for one, so you know, if in the end we have two tops, I can walk away fine with that. Um, with four, I do start to get a, a little bit more annoyed, mostly because the third and fourth, which I think were Sasha Lehman and Stefano Gazelfi, they didn't make it because of that. And when speed is their specialty, you know, lead, yeah. well, sorry, when lead is their specialty, 
it's that's that's a hard pill to swallow because the speed specialists they literally won one round. Basso won the speed and uh, he climbed actually really well on the other two, but came eighth and eighth and made the Olympics. And so it's hard when you then tell the speed climbers, hey, yeah, you topped the route, but uh, you know you were a minute too slow because your climbing style is slower than the others and you didn't make it. So when I take that comparison, uh, I find it annoying. Maybe even the same if the boulderings were really easy and then you have a whole bunch of people that have four flashes. So it's, it's a little bit unfortunate for those athletes, but we'll continue to have those discussions with all the different parties. And as an athlete re representative, I, I feel like it is my duty to bring that voice uh, to the board. Did you have any comment on the idea of Yerne being attacked by a volume at that Toulouse qualifier? Like, how do you, what do you do after that kind of scenario? Uh, and not as, in, not as Yerne in his situation, but when that stuff kind of happens, does anything need to be said to the root setters of the IFSC? Because that's obviously a terrible thing to happen. Nobody planned for it, but what do you do? I mean, first and, and, and most important, uh, he wasn't injured. Uh, it was actually close from what I heard, like a, a couple feet even. And, uh, you know, I didn't even know how many screws were in it. I kind of think that they had enough screws, but maybe they only had one screw on the, the focal point of where he was pulling super hard. Sometimes they'd put in screws too, and then it goes at a weird angle, and then they only get a couple of threads. So when they put it back on, actually the, the volume was chipped a bit, but I'm sure they put, you know, 12 screws in after. So, you know, no one got hurt. Uh, what was actually the most weird is that they didn't, put any other climbers out right after him. And then there was a dull of like 15 minutes where they fixed it. And then they were like, oh, we need to wait seven or eight minutes for Yurne to go again. And and I didn't know the rules well enough, but I was like, why don't you just send out two climbers? Yeah. 10 minutes will pass and then Yurne can go. And I didn't want to go to the rules, so someone else can look that up. But uh, uh, little little small things that they can fix. Uh, and then the, the last like serious question, uh, just about the, the issue with uh, the Japanese quotas. Um, I'm not going to ask you to interpret it for everybody, but in this weird scenario where even the athletes involved may not be sure of what's going on, um, what do you think is, is the best way forward just for the athletes' sake with, uh, with Miho and Kai originally being unsure, from my perspective at least, and now sounding like they are going, but Japan's still sending athletes to Toulouse. Uh, is there a, a best way to solve this? From an athlete perspective, especially in the case of Kai and Miho, it's in their best interest to uh, talk to the federation and uh, do what they want. Um, in the end, if they start to fuss or start to, they need to know their rights as athletes, um, which I've talked to them about. Um, but you know, they need to definitely listen to the federation. They definitely don't want to have any animosity towards the federation. They're going to need to work with them. Eventually, if they hold their spots as Olympians as their second, which currently they are second, and they go, they're going to go with their federation. And so we'll see um, what happens with everything, and hopefully we'll have a decision um, by the new year. Cool. Uh, and then last question. I've heard you've played some StarCraft in your day. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, what race do you play? Terran, Zerg, Protoss, what's your style? So I was always a random. Really? Uh, because, I don't know, I, could, I never, I, maybe the same as climbing. I never wanted to be a specialist. And so I was always random. Uh, my best races were definitely like Protoss and Zerg. Uh, Zerg for macro and Protoss for micro. And then Terran, I just wasn't as good. So, yeah. Combined athlete of StarCraft. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, uh, thanks very much for coming, man. Uh, make sure you follow Sean McCall on Instagram. It's McCall Sean, at McCall Sean. Follow his journey to the Olympics. Uh, subscribe to Plastic Weekly on YouTube to get more stuff like this. And, of course, if you're looking for the best damn climbing in the world, make sure you come to Joe Rockheads. Thanks so much for watching. Cool, man. That was awesome. We really appreciate it. Cool. Yeah, good question.